I see so many people out this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're glad you're with us. For those of you that were not here last week, I want to recap of what we're studying. Last week we looked in the book of Ephesus, and as we moved around through the book of Ephesus, we saw that they were an example of obedience to God's plan of salvation. And this morning, as I promised then, that we're going to be looking at Ephesus again. So I'd like you to turn with me to Ephesus chapter 2, and this is entitled Ephesus Before and After Conversion. Is everyone able to hear? Can you hear me? <clears throat> I don't know why it sounds low on my end. The Ephesian saints stand as examples of obedience to God's word and for his plan of salvation. Last week we looked in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, and saw that they heard the word, that they believed it, and they were obedient to it. And as we look through the examples of the book of Ephesians, as Paul wrote to them, and we looked in Acts 19 and Acts chapter 20, as Paul had visited the city of Ephesus, we saw that they were examples of exactly of hearing and believing and repenting and confessing and being baptized and being exhorted to live a faithful life. But once they obeyed the gospel, they demonstrated its transforming power, and they also became, as I said last week, a before and after picture. And that's kind of what we're going to be looking at this morning. So I want you to be thinking right now a before and after pictures that you've seen, some advertisements that you can possibly pop in your head. <clears throat> and there are those before and after pictures that are exaggerated, of course, and there's those ones that make you say, that's what I want. I don't want this. I want this, this desired product. And so many forms of advertising use pictures of before and after. A weight loss commercial will show pictures of a person before and after the product. So you can look at that and say, this is not the desired product I want. I want this. So you will use their product, right? These two here of the weight loss of the, the male and the female are using a product. This is an uh, example of an advertisement. But it's interposed over the image that might be the undesirable image is a can top. And the idea here is you pop the can. See the can down in the corner? This is their product. You pop the can and out comes this, the body that you might want, right? And if you notice the guy, well, there's a lot more exercise in just eating what's in that can that was involved in this transformation. Right? Lots of these weight loss programs, you look at the fine print and it says you have to do something. You can't just take their product. You have to mix it with a steady diet and exercise regimen. Right? Sometimes it tells you you can't just take this product. You have to do something about it. I kind of like the, the wrinkle one. Who wouldn't want that? Right? If this, if this could do what it says it would do, I mean, this would fly off the shelves. But Becky and I both agreed. We kind of like the picture of the lion in the before picture than the after. But if you're one that doesn't want your hair to look like that lion's, then you might want this product so you can look really sleek and shiny. So a before and after picture supplies a, a, an image in your head that you can say, I don't want this, I want this. And if this product can get me there, well, then you buy that product. And so before and after pictures are very effective. But I would say this, they're effective if you believe they can do what they advertise they can do. That's really only when they're going to be effective, is if you believe they can do what they say they can do, and if you follow the directions. Even these weight loss programs that say, this is not just a, a simple diet for a short time. This is a lifestyle-altering product. Right? You have to commit to doing this and exercising in order to get the desired product. You can't just sit back and take the product and ignore all the other instructions and say, well, this didn't work. Right? They'll be able to come back and say, well, did you follow the directions? So a before and after picture provides a very valuable information. But it's only effective if you believe that that product has the ability, has the power to deliver what it says it can do. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 18, Paul pictures one in sin and then contrasts that with the spiritual nature that comes out from the transforming power of the gospel. This is a before and after picture. This is pretty much this little chart, the outline of what we're going to be looking at this morning. Paul pictures them in Ephesians chapter 2 as before coming to know Christ, they're dead in their sins. They walk according to the world and they're children of wrath. But he says the power of the gospel is such that it can take someone dead in their sins and make them alive in Christ. 
They can take someone that walks after the world and turns that person into someone that walks in good works. They can take someone that's destined as a child of wrath. That's someone that's going to meet the wrath of God and turn them into a child of God who's going to meet that embrace of God and that hear those words, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Paul reminds them of what they were before the gospel and then he reminds them of what they became after the gospel. Romans 1.16 says, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. And it has the power to transform hearts and minds and lives. The gospel has the ability. It has the power and is able to take someone in a before picture and transform them into the after picture that Paul paints here for us in Ephesians 2. So turn over to Ephesians 2 with me as we're going to be looking at that. True conversion to Christ involves a real change of heart, real change of life, and a change in spiritual state. Matthew 18.3 and Acts 3.19 talk about this change. Before conversion, one is dead in sins. Paul's going to paint a picture here, a very bleak picture here, reminding them of who they were before they came to know Christ. He says in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead means separated. James 2, chapter 2 and verse 26, James 2, 26, this talks about the physical death. Physical death results when the soul is separated from the body. When the body no longer has the spirit, the body is dead. Ephesians 2, 1 is speaking of any separ spiritual separation. This is a separation from God because of sin and transgressions. There is a spiritual separation that takes place. We looked at many of these same pictures last week. This one is the artist's rendering of what Diana's temple would have looked like. The city of Ephesus was known as the center of Diana worship. These people, as we looked at last week, of who they were before Paul came into the city preaching Jesus and what he did for them, they were idolaters. They were pagans. They gave themselves over to gross immorality. They did whatever the body said it wanted to do. The mind didn't fight it. But yet even people steeped in idolatry were a city that is seen in secular history as the center for Diana worship. A church can be found there. But first, individuals had to obey the gospel to become that church. They were dead in their trespasses and sins before they came to know Jesus, before they could be that church at Ephesus. In Ephesians 2, 1, that spiritual death or separation from God happens because of sin. In verse 2 of chapter 2, it says, In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Men walking according to the course of this world describes those who are separated from God, those who are experiencing this spiritual death. In Ephesians 2, 2, they have a spirit of disobedience. <laughs> Continuing on in verse 3, as we looked at last week. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So the spiritual death or separation of God is caused by men walking according to the course of this world, doing whatever they see fit, doing whatever they please, having a spirit of disobedience and indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Anything that I want to do, I'm going to do. There's no one that can say otherwise. And as we talked about last week, a lot of them could do whatever they wanted to do and still say, we're religious and go to the temple of Diana or whatever temple they wanted to go to. Hadrian's temple is also here in Ephesus in a later date, in the second century. Because if you look at the Greek gods, and then by the Greek gods, you can also look at the Roman gods, the Romans loved the Greek mythology so much that they, when they conquered Greece, they actually took their gods, they changed the story a little bit and changed their names, but, in Eph but it, they pretty much kept their gods. So Zeus becomes Jupiter, and Diana beco or Artemis becomes Diana. And so they pretty much kept the same story, but they tweaked it, they gave it a little Roman tense, but both in the Greece or the Greek mythology and the Roman mythology, these gods were immoral. They acted as men do. Why? Because men took gods and created them in their own image. And so if you wanted to be a drunkard, you could turn to any Greek or Roman god, Dionysus in the Greek, he's the god of wine, and you could say, well, I'm just serving the god of wine. 
And so you can't tell me I can't drink. You can't tell me not to get drunk. I'm drinking to Dionysus. And so forth and so on. You can find any god that has any vice that you want to do and indulge it. And you can claim, well, I'm religious. I'm following after such and such god. So imagine the gospel going into a situation such as that and saying Jesus Christ calls us to be different. Says he is the only God. These other gods are false. And you have to set aside the practices that go with those false gods. But those before were dead. They were dead in their sins. But something happens when Jesus Christ came into the picture at Ephesus. They were dead. They became dead to sin and alive in Christ. After conversion, one is dead to sin and alive in Christ. Here we're going to take a brief detour from Ephesians. I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Romans 6 and verse 1. I want to notice several things. Then we're going to actually turn to Romans 6 and verse 11. So turn over to Romans chapter 6. And let's begin reading in verse 1. In Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? So, before conversion, one is dead in their sins. After conversion, you're dead to sin. He says, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. Remember, before conversion, you're dead in sin. You're a walking corpse. You're the walking dead. That's what he's saying. You're dead in your sins. You're separated from God. You have no hope. That's what he goes on to tell the Ephesians. You have no hope. But he says, Paul's talking to the Romans. He says that old self was crucified in order that it might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Notice verse 7, for he who has died is freed from sin. We, we, we go from one that is dead in sin to one that is dead to sin and made alive with Christ. Look in Romans 6 and verse 11. He says, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And in fact, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, go back to our text, and look in verses 4 and 5. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So a phrase is used there in Romans chapter 6, being dead to sin. That being dead to sin means we're alive in Christ. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, he he bears that out to the Ephesian saints where he says, they were dead in their transgressions, and despite all that, Jesus was able to make them alive together with him. He was able to take one that was dead in their sins and make them alive with him. And so, we look at this before and after picture. Before, one is dead in sin. This is a temple of... Diana that exists in Istanbul, Turkey. It is made to scale based on artist renderings and the many, many compilations of descriptions of it in existence uh, in the ancient world. And so they've recreated Diana's temple in Istanbul, Turkey. And I use it as to represent idolatry, which is what exactly what the saints at Ephesus would have been dealing with. They would have been in the center of this temple worship to Diana or Artemis, depending on if they went with the Roman way or the Greek way. So before, they're dead in sin, but after, they're made alive in Christ. No longer do the images of the temples and all their false gods bring comfort and hope, but their hope can be in that empty tomb. Made alive in Christ. Romans 6 tells us what that means. We crucify that old self. We rise from the water walking in newness of life, being made alive with Christ. As we continue this before and after picture, before conversion, one walks according to the course of this world. And he tells us who that course of the world is, who the leader of it is. It's Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air, he's called. Ephesians 2.2 says, In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that's now working and the sons of disobedience. The course of this world means the cycle or present round of things, according to vines. And I want you to notice some characteristics of those who walk according to the course of this world. And the picture here is of the Celsus Library Ruins. At its time, it once held 12,000 scrolls. And I use it here to represent human philosophy, human wisdom, walking according to the course of this world. Some characteristics of those that walk according to the course of this world are found in Ephesians 4 and verse 17. It says they have a vain mind or futile mind. Futile means empty or profitless. If something is futile, another phrase we use today is spinning your wheels. If you're spinning your wheel, we'll have that picture of someone either stuck in mud or snow in your car. And no matter how much you rev it, no matter how many RPMs those wheels get, nothing happens. It's fruitless. It's empty. It's profitless. Coming from Alaska, I can tell you we spun our wheels quite a bit. We understand that picture. We know what that means. But I've also been places where we spun our wheels in mud. When I lived in Washington State, I had a 4x4 blazer. And I'd always heard of friends that went four-wheeling, and so I took a friend, and we went four-wheeling, and we had a great time until I went into a mud puddle. It looked like just part of the land, but I sunk all the way to my front door's window. <laughs> my engine was still going. It was kind of up, and those wheels were spinning. And in fact, when the police officer came on the scene, he said he was going to give me his dry cleaning bill. He was covered in mud because of my spinning wheels. So we understand this idea of being futile. This idea of being profitless and unfruitful. We can do things that have absolutely nothing that goes forward. No progression. Right? That's what being of this world means. A vain mind. Futile, empty, profitless. Ephesians 4.19 describes the life devoted to lasciviousness and uncleanness. Running to sexual immorality with greediness, it says. When you're greedy for something, it means you can't get enough. He's describing their lifestyle in this before picture. Before coming to know Christ, they were immoral. They were vain. They were futile. He says in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, that this futile way of life can be described as the works of the flesh in Ephesians chapter 5, 19 through 21. And we see this in Ephesians 2 and verse 3. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. We want another list of what this looks like. Go look in Galatians 5, 19 to 21 and see those things that you can practice that would keep you out of heaven. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, another list of unrighteousness listed as the lust of the flesh, these things that will keep you from inheriting the eternal kingdom of God. Ephesians 2, 2, and look over in Ephesians 5 and verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. What is empty again? Futile, vain, profitless. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. What did he say they were in that before picture? Going back to Ephesians 2 and verse 2, in verse uh, 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. He said they were set for destruction. That's what he's telling them later in chapter 5 and verse 6. They were set for destruction because they were children of wrath. They were as sons of disobedience. The life of one walking according to the course of this world is futile. 1 Peter 1.18 describes it that way. Romans 6.21 tells us the wages of sin is death. Or that's in verse 23. And if Romans 6 and verse 21 describes this futile way of life and where it leads it leads to that committing sin. And then verse 23 of Romans 6 tells us sin will produce death. The wages of it is death. So, the life of walking according to the course of this world is a futile life. It is profitless. It is spinning your wheels. It's not going to get you anywhere. But then an after picture is painted here. They walked after the world before conversion, but then Paul paints a picture of the after effect is now they walk in good works. They walked in good works. Look in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Good here is not left up to our imagination of, well, whatever I think is good, 
Now, Jesus answered that in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. He said, there are people that are going to come to him saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things? We, we prophesied in your name. We healed the sick. We cast out demons. And he says to them, they did it outside of his authority. And so he didn't know them. They worked lawlessness. That means they're outside the bounds. And he said in verse 21, the one that does the will of his father who is in heaven will enter into heaven. Not just those saying, Lord, Lord. Look at all that we have done. What he's telling us is we can't just do those things that we think are good and think that that's going to get us into heaven. That's a man-made conception. We have to do those things that are good as defined by God. So good in connection with works, according to Vine, describes that which being good in its character, the constitution, is beneficial in its effect. But God tells us the works that we are to be engaged in. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, these good works are set forth in God's word. God's word is inspired and it's profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof. And it's profitable to show us how to be a good workman that needs not to be ashamed. It's profitable to show us how to be completely equipped to be a good servant of God. In Ephesians 3, 20 through 21, after conversion, one can use his life to the glory of God. That's one way that we do those good works. In Ephesians 5, 7 through 17, he says to walk in the light. Walk as being wise and know God's will. The alternate to that is to continue walking in the dark, being unwise, having our hearts darkened with understanding, and to not know God's will. He says there in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians chapter 4, he talks about the Gentiles being darkened in their understanding, ignorant according to God's word, because they were chasing after sexual immorality with greediness. They ran to it. But he says the contrast is walk in the light, walk as being wise, and know God's will. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, we can let our light shine before men that they see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So this before and after picture. Again, the Celsus library used to represent human wisdom, human philosophy. They walked according to the world. But after conversion, they stand as this picture of those who are walking in good works, not according to their own desires and whims, not to what they think is good, but walking within the bounds, within the Christ's authority and doing those things that he says are good. And so one before conversion a picture that is painted is one as a child of wrath. One as a child of wrath. In Ephesians 2 and verse 3 he describes them. He says among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Paul's lumping himself in there too. He was a Jew not just a Gentile as these are in Ephesus. He's saying among them we too. He's saying as himself Paul and his companions and those that are with him. He says they once were there too. He says they lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. He says we were like you. We were once children of wrath. This is the ruins of Hadrian's temple that was uh, erected in the 2nd century B.C. Or I'm sorry, 2nd century A.D., the same book of Ephesians, which reveals God's great love, mercy, and grace in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, also reveals God's great wrath. In Ephesians 5, 6, talks about the wrath of God will fall on those that are the sons of disobedience. So how important is it to look at the label warning and see you don't want to be a son of disobedience? So we see the before picture that they were sons of disobedience. We find in Ephesians 5, 6, that carries a heavy penalty. The wrath of God will fall on the sons of disobedience. So we don't want the before picture. We want to look at the product that will turn us from that into a child of God. We don't want to be the children of wrath, the sons of disobedience. We want to be a child of God. So we look at the before picture. How, do they, how did they get to this place where they were children of wrath? Ephesians 5, 6 describes them as children of disobedience. And that they're going to know the wrath of God. It's going to fall upon them. In Hebrews 10, 26 and verse 31, For those that have had the knowledge of the truth explained to them, have come to know that knowledge of truth, whether we're talking about a Christian or someone that chooses not to believe, or a Christian that falls away. He says to sin willfully is to expect judgment. 
They have trampled underfoot the Son of God. They have considered His blood of the covenant as unclean, the very thing that washed them and sanctified them. And in so doing, it says they insult the Spirit of grace. It says for that individual, there's nothing left but a terrifying expectation of judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 11, Paul sought to lead men to salvation in Christ. He said, we persuade men, knowing the fear of God. In verse 10, he says, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 11, he says, since we know the fear of God, we persuade men. Why? We don't want them to face God as a son of disobedience, as a child set for the wrath of God. We want them to be saved. In Romans 2, 5 to 10, the day of wrath is described so it's not left to our imagination. The day of wrath is described as the day of judgment. When Paul says the day of wrath will fall, or God's wrath will fall on the sons of disobedience, he's talking about at the day of judgment. They're going to hear those terrifying words Jesus describes in Matthew 25, 41. When he speaks to those parted to his left, depart from me, you accursed ones, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He says the eternal fire. We need to understand men have never sinned against God with impunity. That means no one has ever gotten away with it. Even in times when people thought they were getting away with it. God knows what they have done and they're going to be called to account. Adam and Eve died. That means separated from God spiritually because of their sin in Genesis 3. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. What kind of death is that second death, that eternal fire? Matthew 25, 41. Revelation 20, 13 to 15, and Revelation 21, 8 describe that eternal fire, a lake of fire that burns with brimstone. It describes it twice as the second death. We know what the wrath of God entails. God didn't leave it as a mystery. He wanted us to know how terrifying it is so we can look at the before picture and want the after picture instead. We need to remember men have never sinned with impunity before God. And even according to men's standards, well, they died and they got away with it. No, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We're all, all, the small and the great, Matthew 25, Revelation 20, all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and all going to be recompensed, that is, rewarded according to what we have done, whether good or bad, it says. No one is going to escape the judgment of God. But we're going to stand before him either as a child of wrath or we're going to stand before him as a child of God. That's going to be the difference, the defining difference when we stand on that day of judgment. Either it'll be as a child of wrath or it will be as a child of God. After conversion, Paul paints this picture of one who is a child of God. I want you to read with me in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 16. In verse 14, he says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, talking about Jew and Gentile, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them. So he's talking about this new body, Jew and Gentile sitting together, calling one another brother and sister. Something that had not happened before. And he says in verse 16, And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints, and are of God's household. To be part of God's household, we read, is to be a son, is to be a child of God. Romans 8, 14 to 17 describes this adoption process, if you will. That they become an heir with God, that they are fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, and that the Holy Spirit himself testifies. So Ephesians 2, 16 says, one is reconciled to God. In Ephesians 2, 18, he has access to the Father. And in verse 19, he's in God's household, his family. Go to 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1 says, Now we know we are children of God. Why? Because we're in his household. Romans 8, 14 to 17. We were adopted, made an heir of God. And as such, we have an inheritance that says, 
reserved in heaven, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. I want you to see another blessing about this. Look with me in Romans 5. Turn away from Ephesians just briefly. Look in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. I want you to look at the language used there in Ephesians 2, 16 and 19. Who was reconciled? Jew and Gentile were reconciled man to man. The enmity wall erased, gone. We are man, then that one new body, Jew and Gentile alike, reconciled to God. Again, the barrier wall erased, removed, because Christ shed his blood to remove sin, to wash it away from mankind. And so we have access to the Father. We're reconciled to him. And that passage in Romans 5 says, he died for us, we're justified in his blood, and because of that we're saved from the wrath of God through him. How can we be saved from the wrath of God? Through him. This reminds me of what Jesus said back in John 14. In verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It is through Jesus that we're reconciled to God. It is through Jesus that we will be saved from the wrath of God. It is through Jesus we're made an heir of God. And so we can look at the before and after picture. The before picture is terrifying, a child of wrath, one that a son of disobedience upon whom the wrath of God will fall on that day of judgment. Where Jesus describes that place in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 43, where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. It's terrifying. A place where your body is never fully consumed but eaten on by worms that never die. A fire that's never quenched crying out for mercy, but being separated eternally from God, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, and no one to hear those cries. Can you even imagine such a place? That's the before picture, a child of wrath. The after picture is the child of God, one who has access to the Father, one who is reconciled to God, one in his household, that Jesus says, I go away to prepare a place for you, to take you where I am you may ever be, in John 14, 1-6. That's an amazing after picture. So Paul paints for us a pretty good and clear picture for the, those saints in Ephesus. But what they were like before the gospel and what they were like after the gospel. Reminding us of what we read last week in Ephesians 1.13. In him, speaking of Jesus, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Paul also says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel has the power to transform and to save. The gospel has that ability to take that before picture and transform us into the after picture if we but follow the directions. You know, there are a lot of, project, pro, there are a lot of products out there that the results seem to be very exaggerated. And you know that that cream, that ointment, that drink, that food isn't going to produce what the picture shows it's going to do. We don't have to feel that way about the before and after picture of the Ephesian saints. We know where they came from. Paul paints a very grisly, ugly picture of what they were before and paints an awesome picture of what they became afterwards and tells us what did it. The product was the gospel. It has the power of God for salvation. It can do what it says it can do, and we can see it in the lives, not only in these people of old, but we see it in our lives. Look around this room. People here are children of God, saints, Christians. We know personally and individually the power of the gospel and what it did for us where we were before and where what we have become after, don't we? That's the picture, that's the message we need to be taking into the world around us. Because that's a before and after picture that is very effective. Because the gospel has the power to transform. There is great change involved. There is great change involved in conversion. When we follow the directions, 
This change demonstrates the love of God, the power of Christ's blood, and the power of the gospel when we're obedient to his word. And so we can see the before and after picture. This doesn't just describe people of old in an ancient city. This describes people around us today. This describes you and me before Jesus. Before conversion, that before picture would show us dead in sins, walks after the world and a child of wrath. But after conversion, having come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, we're alive in Christ. We walk according to good works. And we're made children of God. No longer set for wrath and destruction, but to live with him forever. The gospel changes lives from darkness of sin to light and the very hope of heaven. My admonition and encouragement for us this morning is to recognize the gospel's power to save. The gospel's power to change our lives. And have you obeyed the gospel call today? Have you obeyed it? If you're not a Christian this morning, you need to be to repent of your sins. To confess Jesus Christ as the living true God, the Son of God who came and died and paid your debt of sin. To repent of those sins, to turn away from them, to repent means to change direction. To be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. That you might rise out of the waters walking in newness of life. No longer that child of wrath set for destruction, but a child of God set for the sweet embrace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ one day and invited into his eternity. If you are a child of God this morning, not living the way that you should, that invitation is for you as well. We can fall from grace. The Galatians were told they had fallen from grace. If you are not living the way you should, now is the time to make correction. Now is the time to realize it. You too can repent and be brought back into the fold of God and be renewed. And if we can assist you in any of these things this morning, the waters of baptism, the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, come forward now and let it be known while we stand and while we sing.